The Bloodfledge abduction is not that well known, but needs reminding because of the detail it offers. Spawning consciousness, communicated telepathically, reminds us that glimpses obtained in abduction have serious implications and meaning. Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, your destination for the exploration of all things unidentified. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. I'll start by saying with no agenda other than to inform and enlighten, you must listen to the story to the very end to understand its significance. There are plenty of new learnings here. It was August 7th, 1968 at the Bufflet Summer Camp for Girls near Colchester, Vermont. During a two-day break between camp groups, with most staffers off-site, a few remained behind to prepare the camp and maintain facilities and equipment. Michael Lapp, working summer job as maintenance worker for all water equipment at the camp, age 16, and Janet Cornell, 19, a water skiing instructor, were standing on a lake dock at 8.10 p.m. when they saw a glowing cigar-shaped object descending down across the lake, releasing three small round objects out of its underside. Two of them streaked away, while the third silently hovered towards them. It paused over the lake right in front of them, with two humanoids visible in a window topside of the craft. It was disc-shaped, with a dome on top, and perimeter lights of white or amber color. And Michael remembers thinking with curiosity more than fear, but it was a real physical object, and that's when the disc moved to a position right above their heads, close enough for him to reach to the object and touch it, if he jumped, as if in direct response to his thought question. That was when a brilliant beam of light engulfed them both. Michael reached out to Janet, and they both fell onto the dock and lost consciousness. Their entire recall of what happened next was only realized over 10 years later. But what Michael remembers next, confused and dazed, is laying on the dock, dizzy, a bit nauseated, and realizing something strange had happened without understanding what. He saw Janet waking up right next to him as if both had just taken a nap. Both felt tired, confused and dizzy, as they stood up, hearing cars arriving near the shore and some staffers approaching them to go swimming at night in the lake. The craft was still above their heads at this moment, diminishing as it ascended, and Michael caught a glimpse of it, but no one else seemed to notice, and neither of them said anything. From the parking lot, their area of the lake, and the sky above them, it would have been partly blocked by trees and a bluff, so the visibility of the craft could have been completely blocked to the arriving group. But there are two additional witnesses, however, later confirmed that they did see a bright light above the lake. Susan Middleton and Barbara Bryant, they were the first to arrive at the dock, staring up at the sky to see a light fading into distance and disappearing. Michael and Janet stood up and stared with their fellow campers before returning to their cabins to go to bed unusually early and expressing nothing to their friends about the incident and without talking to each other at all. It's as if what just happened, no matter how extraordinary and life-changing, it simply didn't occur to them to talk about it. It was rather as if nothing had happened at all. It was erased from their memories and their mind was reset to not recalling anything at all. And this happens a lot in abduction cases. Michael continued to feel odd about the evening, however, having vague memories of meeting strangers in a strange dark place, but did not bring himself to talk about it to anyone, and least of all to Janet. Days passed, new summer campers arrived, and a couple of weeks later, the camp was closed for the summer, and Janet and Michael went their separate ways, not to see, hear of, or speak to each other for almost 11 years. Fragments and glimpses, however, kept resurfacing in Michael's mind as vague memories of a very strange night at Buff Ledge Lake with Janet on the dock. They were memories he could not shake or reason with or fit to a sense of reality. Coming across other information and stories, 
He questioned if he had seen a UFO and had an encounter experience. Ultimately, this prompted him to contact a UFO investigator, Walter Webb, at the Center for UFO Studies, who initiated a five-year investigation into the incident. Together, they reached out and found Janet. And in the words of Walter Webb, who is experienced in handling UFO investigations, quote, Aside from a brief and controlled reunion at Boston's Logan Airport, I kept them apart and interviewed them separately during my five years inquiry, end quote. It is also the testimony of Michael Lapp and Janet Cornell that they followed Webb's instruction and never talked to each other about the event until after Webb had concluded his collection of accounts of both of them separately, including undergoing a supervised hypnotic regression therapy performed in the Boston area by professional hypnotherapists to uncover further details of their stories. And there was a lot of detail. Michael realized he had a considerable amount of missing time, as much as an hour that night, while Janet confirmed not only seeing the UFO with Michael, but also being brought on board a craft via a beam of light that was directed at them on the dock. Both confirmed a dimly lit interior that included a hospital-like equipped examination room with benches and beds, equipment hanging from the ceiling, and computer monitors, screens, and equipment all around the room. Both independently confirmed that they had a guide that remained in constant telepathic communication with each of them to keep them calm and to inform them of the purpose and process of the examination. Michael described them as small, perhaps about five feet tall, with grayish skin color and skin-tight greenish bodysuit. Their most striking features were their eyes, large and almond-shaped, on disproportionately large and elongated shaped heads, each having just a slither of a mouth and nostrils. Janet was told to keep her eyes closed, and interestingly, she did. My insertion here is that perhaps they knew her fearful reaction would disturb the process too much by traumatizing her, and second observation suggests requesting she keep her eyes closed meant that she actually would, without a question. Janet's experience was therefore more of a sensory one. She did, however, admit to taking a peek at a point, and what she saw was so disturbing to her, the visage of the beings and the interior of the craft that she quickly closed her eyes again. This informs they knew what her likely reaction to the experience was going to be beforehand, prompting the closed eye suggestion of one of them and not both. Michael remembers watching Janet's body being examined and two figures using a handheld light to look into her eyes. The skin on her forearm was scraped with a pencil-like instrument and a blood sample was taken. He also witnessed a triangular machine descending from the ceiling with flexible tubes that were guided into Janet's orifices, sucking fluid samples, and he saw all of its process. This was when Michael vividly remembers asking in his head what they were actually doing. And he did receive an answer. We are spawning consciousness. Let's repeat that. Spawning consciousness. At the time, I don't think Michael, Janet, or even Walter Webb, 10 years later, would have any idea what that could mean. Today, we may. Janet remembers the examiners lifting and dropping her arms and inspecting her long hair. She felt a heat source next to her body and sensed the device attached to her neck and head. While two figures worked on Janet's body, Michael saw a third entity monitoring consoles situated on a rectangle up against the wall that appeared to him to have multiple screens. On the screens, Michael saw symbols, graphs and lines, and movements that he understood to be readings of results of the examination of Janet's body. Janet saw the panel as well. While her eyes were being examined, it's another detailed description she confirms independently. The abduction experience was yet to come more complex when Michael looked up through a domed window to realize they were approaching the cigar-shaped mothership hovering above. The disc-shaped craft was headed into its underbelly and he realized they were now inside of it in a huge hangar. Next thing he remembers is descending through the floor of the small craft into the mother craft where they were whisked up some levels to another examination room 
populated with more beings, all looking near identical. It got stranger still when a helmet was put on Michael's head and multiple beings staring at a screen seemed to Michael to be nodding to one another that what they were seeing on the screen, presumably from reading his head, they were approving of, that the results were positive or that they were seeing in his head what they had hoped to see. He could not confirm this, but only speculate, based on their body language. As everyone in the room kept staring, a being touched his arm and his vision dissolved before his eyes. All he could see was a fantasy landscape, almost park-like, filled with colorful plants and trees and purple skies above. He saw multiple beings wandering the park, human-like, and he saw Janet crying, standing right next to him. The next thing he remembers was a dome full of TV screens, with one of them showing himself and Janet laying on the dock, protruding into Buff Ledge Lake. He kept staring at the screen as if staring at himself, alive. And in that moment, with a vantage point outside of his body, he felt sucked back, like the moment you're falling asleep, and found himself back on the dock, by the lake, at Buff Ledge, laying down, just like on the TV screen, next to Janet. They gradually woke up in confusion to hear the approaching cars and voices of Susan and Barbara staring up to the sky. A potential fifth witness saw lights above the lake. Playhouse director Elaine Thomas was located at the parking lot as well, rehearsing lines from a play. When she saw strange lights hovering above the lake, and when she approached the dock among the campers, the lights were already disappearing above their head. Michael and Janet each underwent psychological evaluation as well as stress test and voice analysis. The results indicated that each of their independent accounts were truthful and their emotional and rational processing and state of the experience through hypnotherapy was traumatic and exactly as would be expected in a truthful setting. Now, the volume of incredible details here attached to this story leaves so much to unpack, study, and compare to other experiencer accounts. And there is a lot of comparisons identical to other experiencers' account here. However, today, I want to solely focus on two aspects side by side and their potential implication. It's where connecting the dots and learning from comparables helps us expand our horizon of understanding and the meaning behind the experience. It gets us closer to the purpose and hopefully the truth. First, the statement about the spawning of consciousness. This awakens images of reproductive storylines threaded throughout the entire alien abduction syndrome body of experiences. And it's not just about physical reproductive abilities, but also the spawning of consciousness. If we visit the writings of Sitchin and others regarding the Anunnaki as an example, the creation of mankind, the epic of Gilgamesh, the biblical fable of the forbidden fruit. With the Anunnaki, the story goes that human consciousness came about without authorization, as brother Enki and Enlil battled for leadership and the creation of a race of earthlings that would become homo sapiens to serve their purpose of harvesting gold. Through the creation process of this new species, they ended up with a soul, and with it the ability to survive death, reproduce, and grow a new race of conscious beings. And perhaps this ability to create new souls is what they're referring to as the spawning of new consciousness. It is also possible that this is a realm where the greys, as described by Michael and Janet, do not have domain or access over the spiritual world. Does that mean they may lack the consciousness themselves, that Michael, equipped with headgear, was able to pop out of the spacecraft into a fantastic landscape? that frankly is described very similarly to Worlds Beyond by those who have had a momentary out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, a place where they rendezvous with other souls in a spiritual landscape, where some describe purple skies, fantastic lands, populated with wandering souls and colorful plant life. What if the beings, through Michael's out-of-body experience, induced by a device embedded in a helmet, 
were able to peek through the veil and into the world of souls. Michael's ability to provide this glimpse to his abductors, to a place that they have no access to, that is the thing that pleased them. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, your reliable source for exploring the unidentified and unexplained. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness, and please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.